Good morning. I'm Pastor Brian and welcome. I'm so glad y'all could come out this morning, celebrate this day and, and look into the Word and see what God has for us and, and we just appreciate you all coming out. It's, it's such an honor and privilege. And um, I want to give you a little bit of a, a background and what we've been doing, like I mentioned in the announcements, is we've been walking through Scripture. We've been talking about uh, the, the chronological order of Scripture. And we walk through this time of Judges, and if you remember the time of Judges, is this just nauseating cycle of, of being close to God, falling away from God, getting close to God, falling away from God, and uh, you seeing God raising up Judges uh, or, or these military leaders to... Uh, to free the Israelites from oppression and uh, we then go into this this from this bigger picture and we we narrow in down to this small picture of one family and, and Ruth and Boaz and we talk about Ruth and Boaz and then we see that the reason they're placed in there is because Ruth and Boaz are in the lineage of Jesus Christ and after that now we're gonna we're gonna kinda step back again take a bigger picture and and look a little bit at a, on a larger scale but we're right at the very end of this cycle of judges as we step into the book of first Samuel now it's so appropriate as we step into this book of first Samuel that it starts with a mom <laughs> And so we're going to talk about this mom for a few minutes today. Now this mom is, her name is Hannah. And, and actually she starts out in the, in the beginning of 1 Samuel as she's not a mom. She, she's, she's barren, she can't have any children. And so she goes to the temple and she prays to God. And she asks God, God, I would, I would like a child, Lord, if you could bless me with a child. And so she begins praying for her son before the son is ever conceived or born. Okay, and, and this, is, this is speaking about a, a great mom here, a great mother figure. And so she does several things for her son before he's ever born. She prays for him and she dedicates him to God. And so then we see throughout, the, the, as the story progresses, that she does become pregnant. She has a son. His name is Samuel, hence the book First Samuel. And she then dedicates Samuel to God. And uh, we see that in doing that, she continues to pray for him. And she dedicates him to God, she gives him to God, and she provides for him year after year. It says each year she would come up to him and she would bring him a new cloak or a new, a new robe. And, and so we see, again, these attributes of a mother that are, that are wonderful. And a couple of things I just want to point out about her is that Hannah sets a context for her son. Okay, through her prayer, through her dedication... Uh, dedicating him to God through her provision for him, what she's doing is she's setting a context for her son, and this is how I'm, I want your life to lay out. Now, we go through uh, life sometimes and we say, well, I, you know, the important thing for my child is that I, I have a college fund for my child, I give my child their first car, I, I, I make sure my child has a good education, and, and, and all too often, unfortunately, sometimes maybe we, we forget the the pivotal, the, the, the primary things of prayer and dedicating our, our children to God. And so I just want to call upon moms that uh, this morning, as, as you think about your children, that, that you would pray for your children, that you would set this context for your children, that you would pray for them, that you would dedicate them to God. Because, I mean, let's face it, sometimes with your kids, you know, we use this saying, that's all you can do, right? Just pray for your kids. You know, God, they're yours. <laughs> Give them to God. So I don't know what you're going to do with them. But. Now, now we say that in joking and in jest, but that is the absolute best thing we can do for our kids. Pray for our children and give our children to God. That gives them a context that sets them up for, for a wonderful life, a godly life. So I want to take, a, again, a moment talking about this... Uh, setting context for our children and mothers and, and, and being good mothers. That we need to understand that, that mothers have this, this awesome responsibility when setting a context for their children. This huge responsibility. Now if you pray and you, and you, and you give your children to God, you put them in a context that sets them up for success. Okay, maybe not the world's success, but godly success. But the scary part of it is, this position of mother has the ability to set your children up in a context that goes in the opposite direction. 
Okay, and, and we need to be aware of that as, as moms or as parents that we have an ability to set a context for our children and we need to be aware of what context we're setting. So I challenge you to pray for your children today and to dedicate your children to the, to the Lord. And now I want to ask anybody who is a mom, a grandmother, or a mother figure for just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you could stand. Not you, Ken. I want to point out this is pretty typical, isn't it? It's Mother's Day and we're making you do the work. We're making you stand up, right? I considered having you all sit and making everybody else stand. But what I want to do is I just want to acknowledge you. I want to thank you. I want to, I want to say we know that A, you're not perfect. And, we, and I want to apologize on behalf of everyone for, for putting that expectation on you. Because it's not about perfection. It's about, you know, you're our moms. And, and we love you all. And we appreciate what you have done and what you continue to do for your children. And, and we want to, to support and, and pray for you all as well. And so, for just this moment this morning, I would like everybody just to be able to, to recognize you all. So, thank you all. Thank you. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, I, I just I thank you for this, this gift that you've given us of motherhood, Lord. And like so many gifts, Father, it is it's an awesome responsibility. And, and I pray that, that for, for all the mothers, for, for all the fathers, for, for everyone, Lord, that we would first turn to you for guidance and support. And then as we set out upon our, our duties that you've given us, our God-given uh, duties. Lord, I pray a blessing upon the mothers that you would uh, just uh, lift them up, to draw them close, give them the comfort of your loving arms. And Lord, now as we look into your word, as we look into this book of 1 Samuel, I pray that you would, that you would bring uh, clarity and that you would touch our hearts and that you would compel us to take that next step closer to you. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So Hannah sets this context for her child. And his, this child's name is Samuel. She dedicates him to God. She, she literally has put him in God's hands. And so he is raised in this, this temple. And uh, he is raised and, and, and she named him Samuel because her prayers lifted up to God. Samuel means God heard. God heard her cry out. And so she named him after that that plea. And uh, it's interesting that as Samuel is being raised in this temple, God calls out Samuel. And if you've read through this yet, you, you see that this is a pretty humorous exchange. This is almost like, like some kind of Abbott and Costello routine. Because God calls out to Samuel. Samuel jumps up. He runs in the other room. He thinks somebody else is hollering for him. He says, hey, did you call me? No, no. Go back to sleep. So he goes back, lays down, God calls him, he does it again, jumps up, and runs in. Did you call me? No, go back to sleep. So this happens like three times. And then finally, finally they say, you know what, I think God's calling you. So next time you hear your name, just answer. And so Samuel does. And one of the things that is interesting about Scripture is that when God calls Samuel, it says that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Now, that, that kind of goes into this whole idea. We talked last week about Ruth being a Moabite, and how God used her in such a powerful way. God calls Samuel, who did not yet know him. God works in everybody's life. God works in everybody's life. It is, you know, we, we, mankind is this orchestra that God uses to, to create this, this beautiful symphony that glorifies him. So don't ever think that you're outside of God's grasp. God uses everyone. And uh, so God calls Samuel. Samuel is raised up to be a prophet, and he is the final judge in this series of judges of this, this nauseating cycle of, of going close to God, falling away from God, and close to God. And, and as Samuel grows up, he leads Israel out of the oppression that they're in. And then we get to this pivotal point in the history of Israel. Because we get to this point where the people are, are just sick and tired of this cycle. This judge's cycle of falling away 
And, and they cry out to Samuel after he's released them from oppression. And they say, Samuel, you know what? I, we want a king. We want a king. And, and Samuel points out, well, you have a king. They said, no, no, we want, to, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. We want to get off of this merry-go-round. And, and we've kind of mingled with these other nations. We've seen how they live. And now we're coveting what they have. They've got a king. They've got one guy who's in charge. And we want that. And you know why we want that? We want that because we want him to go before us. Does this ring any bells to anybody? We want a king that will go before us. And again, this is what God has done for the nation of Israel since the time that they left Egypt. So they're crying out. And Samuel says, no, listen, we are a theocracy. We have a king. God is your king. But yet they say, no, 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 we want a king. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Again, uh, God calls us to be holy. He doesn't call us to conform to other nations. He calls us to be holy. And you have the people crying out, Now we want to be just like everybody else. And Samuel says, That's not a good idea. They said, But they have one. And Samuel says, It's not going to work out well for you if you get a king. You've got all these bad things that are going to come at you. And they said, But they have one. And Samuel again says, listen, you're better off without a king. And the people cry out, but they have one. And so Samuel then goes to God. Now, here's one of the things we should probably take a lesson from, is that we have this, this mentality this human mentality that we get caught up sometimes. And we have this cry that we cry out that, that so oftentimes leads us away from God. Because we cry out, but they have one. And we're so worried about what it is that other people have and what is it that looks good on the other side of the fence and the pastures that are over there. And we're so thinking, oh, I, I want that over there instead of what God is blessing us with. And so oftentimes if we follow that instinct or that, that desire or we want that new car or that new uh, infinity car, right? Or... <laughs> and it leads us down a path. No offense if you drive an infinity, by the way. It was a kind of a personal joke. but And it leads us down this path. You know, if, if we want the house, if we want the job, if we want the money, if we want the mistress, if we want the whatever it is that we see somebody else have, has, and, and we say, but they have one. So we need to, to really back away from that, that call, that desire, that, that selfishness that was, is within us that leads us away from God. So God tells Samuel, and Samuel goes to God and he says, hey, listen, they're pretty persistent. They want a king. God tells Samuel, hey, look, don't worry about it. Okay? They're not rebelling against you. They're rebelling against me. And, and this is one of the things also that we should keep in mind because as we go through life, if you're obedient to God and, and you're following God's will and you get persecuted because of that, in other words, you're not in a popular group anymore or, or somebody doesn't like you or they think um, uh, maybe you're just too good for them now or you're, you're holier than thou or, you know, so long as you're not doing this in an arrogant, uh, uh, offensive manner. But if you're following God and being obedient and someone looks down upon you because of that, Rest in the fact that they're not looking down upon you. Okay? They're looking down upon God. And that's God's burden. It's not yours. Okay? They don't, don't think that that's something that you need to carry. So, God says, all right. We'll give him a king. And through God's providence, which we've been seeing over and over and over again, God's providence, he crosses paths with Samuel and a man named Saul. And these two cross paths and Samuel then says, okay, Saul, you're supposed to be king. And after he has this conversation with him, uh, in Samuel 10, 1 Samuel 10, it says, Then it happened when he turned his back to leave, talking about Saul, God changed his heart. Oh, what a monumental moment this is, right? For Saul, 
What a monumental moment when God reaches down out of heaven and touches you and changes your heart. Isn't this all of our desires? Isn't this why we show up to church on Sunday morning? We want God to change our hearts. Because we know that there are things in our hearts that need to be changed. And we rely upon God to do that. And God's going to reach down. He's going to touch us. He's going to change our hearts. And this is what he did with Saul. And it's a beautiful thing, a beautiful picture, because he empowers Saul when he does this. He changes his heart. He empowers Saul. We see Saul then step out. And, and he then uh, delivers the nation from oppression again as king, as the power of God. He steps out. Now he's king. And he goes out and he defeats the Philistines you see now the, the, the cycle then that God wants. God wants to anoint or, or empower. He wants to change someone's heart. And, and he wants them to then go out and act upon that. Now, we see Saul's response initially. When, when, when Samuel makes Saul a king, Saul's response is complete and total humility. Because Saul responds and he says, I, I'm, I'm not a... I'm a Benjamite. I'm of the smallest tribes of Israel. My family is the least of the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you talk to me in this way? Why are you making me king? Does this passage sound familiar? I'm from the little tribe. I'm from the smallest family of the tribe. Remember when Gideon cried that out? The judge, and then God led him in victory with only 300 people in his army. And this is God's way. He, he, he calls the people to feel that are humble. To feel like they're not powerful enough to deliver his message. And this, is, this is God's MO. This is how he operates. So he calls on Saul. And in fact, at the coronation ceremony, Samuel stands up in front of the whole nation and says, Okay, listen, you all wanted a king. I'm going to give you a king. Here's your new king. Your king is Saul. Your king is Saul. And Saul's nowhere to be found. I gotta go looking for Saul. And somebody finally finds Saul, and he's over in the storage area hiding behind some bales of stuff. I mean, he is terrified. And this is their king now, okay? This is this is the person that they're supposed to put the nation in comfort now. Listen, you wanted what everybody else has. Here he is hiding behind the hay. And so they make Saul king. God allows him to become king. Now, uh, Scripture says, so all the people went to Gilgal. Now, and here's the problem, okay? Here's the issue. Here's where we see a turning point. As a king with a changed heart, God has changed his heart. He defeated the Ammonites originally, and now he goes and he's going to battle the, 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 uh, the Philistines, and he wins. God empowered him. He chose him. He gave him power. He went out. He did God's will. He won. And what did he do? He came back. And then he gave glory to God. So all the people went to Gilgal where they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they offered sacrifices and peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the people of Israel rejoiced greatly. So here's the cycle of what it's supposed to be. This is how it's supposed to work. God empowers you. God gives you an assignment. God anoints you with the ability to do that, regardless if you think you can or not. And then your job is to be obedient and go out and do that. You accomplish the task, and then once you've accomplished the task, what is it you're supposed to do? You're supposed to turn around and go, wait, good job, God. You did that. Great job. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to give you thanks. I'm going to give you the glory for that. You managed to accomplish that. That's right devotion. That is the right way that we're supposed to respond. And that is the way that Saul responds after his first battle. The problem rises when he goes into this next battle. Okay, because God says, okay, good job. Remember, okay, he who is faithful with little, God will give him some more. Saul does this. He wins the battle. God says, okay, I'm going to empower you again. Go out. So he goes out and he battles. And he's, he's, he's preparing for the battle. He's out on the battlefield. He's waiting. And, and then things start to take this turn because he's calling for the prophet Samuel to come and to... Uh, to offer sacrifices before the battle. God, we want to give you the glory before we walk into battle. We want to recognize you. We want to understand that you're going before us. And he calls for the, the prophet Samuel. And he waits, and he waits, and he waits. And the prophet Samuel doesn't show up. 
when he wants him to. So Saul then takes it upon himself, a role that's not his, something he hasn't been anointed to do, he's not supposed to do, and he says, okay, fine, I'll offer the sacrifices myself. And he goes and he offers the sacrifices himself. And Samuel then shows up and says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. That's not what God has led you to do. That's, that's not right devotion anymore. So begins this downward spiral. We're all very familiar with what a downward spiral is. Saul wins a battle after this point and he sets up a monument to himself. Scripture gives us the verse. Then after he wins the battle, instead of returning to God and giving God the glory and the praise, then he goes and he sets up a monument to himself. And it begins, continues this downward spiral. This is a stark contrast to the humble beginnings of the king who was hiding among the hay bales at his own coronation. Stark contrast to the man who said, I- I'm not worthy. I'm from the little bitty family, from the little bitty tribe. I'm not worthy. But now, now, when God has empowered him, he then steps up and says, hey, look at what a great job I'm doing. Let's build a monument to me. So, the problem, the question, the confusion comes in because we see that God changed Saul's heart. And yet, Saul goes out and glorifies himself instead of God. So how do we make sense of this in Scripture? If God changed his heart, why did he turn around and go and glorify himself? What are we supposed to do with that? I think we need to understand that God working in your life does not give you immunity. If God works something in your life, that does not mean that from now on you have this inoculation shot. You can no longer ever fall from God. It is not an immunity. So our solution then is we have to put effort into creating this upward spiral. We're all familiar with the downward spiral. Downward spirals we talk about all the time. We know what that is, and that's natural. It's something that, I mean, as, as natural as gravity is, and that's why we call it a downward spiral, because it's so easy to do, to fall into this downward spiral. But we don't ever talk too much about an upward spiral. That takes effort. That takes, that takes discipline. That takes intention. That an upward spiral moves us towards God. Now here's the upward spiral and the way that's supposed to work and the way that Saul initially did it. God empowers you. you. You do something that God empowers you to do. The job that God wants you to do. And then you turn around and you give God the glory because it was His power that did it. And then God will empower you again. Okay, And then we begin this, this upward spiral towards God. But it, it, it's a cause upon us. Certain disciplines, certain things. Here comes a... a a very real danger at any point in these. I mean, we're pretty fickle people, aren't we? Pretty, pretty fickle people. And when, when things are going really good, we like to say, I'm doing a good job. And when things are going really bad, you know, I, we like to go, hey, you're messing with me. And isn't this kind of our life, you know? And, and, okay, so if we say, God, you're messing with me, and then things get better, then, I, hey, I'm doing good. And so we, we need to break that cycle. We need to step out of it. It's a difficult thing to do. Samuel shows up, and he tells Saul, this is, how, this is, this is the response Samuel had to Saul when Saul started to, to set up monuments to himself. To stop glorifying God. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. I'm going to key in on that. To obey is better than sacrifice. That's kind of confusing to us because God told them to commit sacrifices, to, to offer up sacrifices. What is a sacrifice for? It's for sin. A sacrifice is to atone for sin. So, what Saul or what Samuel is telling Saul, it's better for you to put in an ounce of prevention, obedience, put in an ounce of prevention called obedience, 
and to rely upon this pound of cure, which is sacrifice. If you will put in an ounce of obedience and obey, obedience is better than sacrifice. Not that we're going to ever completely remove sacrifice. Okay? Sacrifice will always be necessary. But to live our lives in such a way that says, you know what, I'm just going to rely upon the fact that later on tonight I can grab a lamb, go over to the temple and slit its throat, and then everything that I did is paid for. I can do what I want and then pay for it later. Kind of like a, a, a spiritual credit card. And God's saying, don't do that. Obey. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't rely upon this institution, this, this thing that I've set up for your benefit and use it as a crutch so you can live in such a way that doesn't honor me. Paul says the same thing in the New Testament. He says, uh, what shall we say then? Are we con- to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And his response is, may it never be. Which, which in English doesn't sound real forceful. But in Greek, it's like, no! <laughs> that woke some of you up, didn't it? <laughs> Don't even think about that. You don't sin so that, you, so that grace can increase. You don't go out and commit sin and then assume that the sacrifice will cover it. Obedience is what God wants. That's an act of love. It becomes an act of discipline. What are you willing to put into this? And so uh, Samuel even says that, listen, if you're not obedient, it's the same thing as idolatry. It's the same thing as idolatry if you're not obedient. That caused me to stagger back a few steps. If you don't do what God tells you to do, and you know that, and you don't do it, it's the same thing as picking up an idol, setting it up on your, on your mantle, and worshiping something other than God. That's a pretty powerful statement. So I want to close up with a challenge to you today. I want to, I want to challenge something to everyone here today that will help us step out of this downward spiral and strengthen us for the purpose of climbing in this upward spiral. I acknowledge a downward spiral is easy. Okay? Allowing gravity to work is easy. Upward spirals take effort. The question becomes, and how much effort are you willing to put in to your relationship with God? How much effort are you willing to put in to, to a relationship of love, discipline, effort, does not mean or negate love. Okay? Again, anybody who's married knows that a good marriage takes us effort and discipline. So I want to talk about some disciplines. And you know, it's interesting because discipline comes from the same word, the original word, the, if you look into the etymology of it, as the word disciple. And we're all called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That means we're all called to a level of discipline, practicing certain disciplines. And discipline basically means it's an issue of to learn. How much, if any, of your Christian faith is defined by disciplines? Ravi Zacharias, in talking in this idea about contrasting discipline or will, with this idea of love, the emotion of love, and says, listen, they're, they're not two opposing ideas. He states that love without emotions is drudgery. So we need that love. We need that emotional. Love without emotions is drudgery. And without will or without discipline, it's a mockery. Love is comprised of both. And the purpose of a discipline is to strengthen us. And, you know... God has set this up and so we should understand this. If you want to strengthen your body, you go to the gym, you work out, you go to the track, you run. It takes discipline and effort. If you want to strengthen your body, then you, you work at it. If you want to strengthen your mind, you go to school, you work at it, you put in effort. If you want to strengthen your spiritual life, it doesn't just happen. You work at it. And understanding that you work at it with the power of God. God will give you that power, you use that power, you work at your discipline, your spiritual life, and then you turn around and you give thanks to God with it. Now there's a whole lot of disciplines that we could talk about this morning. 
I didn't want to throw so many at you that they just kind of went in one and out the other. And so I'm going to focus on three disciplines this morning that I want to challenge you to incorporate into your life, to put into your life. We could talk about the disciplines of relationships. We can talk about disciplines of purity, integrity, of work, the discipline of giving. We can talk about all these things, but I want to focus on three this morning. Three pivotal disciplines that if we will, if we will work on these, we can draw closer to God. I think the first thing we need to do is we need to discipline our mind. Scripture tells us that we should not be conformed to the world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And it tells us this because we have some control over this. We, we control what we think. We control the thoughts that go in through our mind. And it becomes a battle sometimes, but we have some control over this. The book of Philippians tells us whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. These are the things we're supposed to fill our minds up with. These are the things that we're supposed to think about and put into our minds and pay attention to what we're putting into our minds. I just read an article last night, and uh, I'm probably not going to get exactly right because I didn't think about talking about it today, but... Somebody suggested to a pastor who was writing this article, why don't you go see the movie Hangover? It's a great movie. It's really funny. Don't raise your hand if you've seen it. I don't want to know. <laughs> and so he goes to some of his staff and he says, hey, somebody suggested this movie Hangover. Should I go see it? And, oh yeah, that's a great movie. You should go see it. And so he looked into it a little bit further and he goes to a, a, a website called Screen It. And they tell you in detail what's in the movie and whether it's appropriate for family or not. He says, in the movie, there's 91 F-bombs dropped. That's over one per minute. He went back to, and there's a whole lot of other stuff, but just that one word, he went back to his staff and he said, do you realize that there's 91 F-bombs in this movie? And I said, no, I didn't even realize it. Are we paying attention to the things that are going into our minds? Is it appropriate for a movie, if you go to a movie and see a movie with 91 F-bombs in it, is that okay? And if you came here this morning and sat down and I started throwing out one F-bomb per minute, is that okay? Would that be appropriate in this context, in this setting? I think most of you would go, no, not supposed to happen here. Is it okay if it happens out there? Is it okay if we fill our minds with those things? Are we even aware of what we're filling our minds with anymore? A discipline of the mind. Pay attention what it is we're putting into our minds. Think about the things that are lovely and right and honorable. Fill our minds with that. A discipline of prayer. This is our communication with God. Okay, there's no set formula. There's no way you have to do it. There's no way you have to sit or kneel or hold your hands or bow your head. Prayer is communicating with God, pure and simple, however you want to do that. And I've had people say, I don't know how to pray. Talk to God. However you're comfortable with doing it, talk to God. You can put on all the pretty words and all the flair and you can really try to impress God, but it's not going to do any good. He knows your heart. Talk to Him how you talk to Him. Scripture tells us, pray without ceasing. That sounds pretty tireless. I had somebody ask me the other day, do I have to say amen when I'm done with prayer? No. And the problem is, a lot of people say amen as if, God, now I'm done talking to you, so I'll go live my life now. <laughs> Leave those lines of communication open. God is there listening to every word that we throw up to Him. And listen for His response too. Because He will respond. And a discipline of reading God's Word. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Listen, if we don't read through God's Word, whether it's one line a day or one book a day, Whatever it is, if you don't pick up the Word and somehow ingest it into your body, whether you listen to it on tape or read it in the book or have somebody read it to you, if you're not taking it in, you're not going to get to know who God is. 
He gave us this for a purpose and a reason and so that we can see how is it that He responds to life when we live it out. We can look at Saul and Samuel and Ruth and Boaz and, and Abraham and see how God responds to them when they act or think a certain way and we can know that that's how God responds to us. This is how we get to know God, who He is and what He wants in our life. If you think that you can do it without this, then, then go and find a woman and marry her and never speak a word to her and then see how well your marriage is going to go without knowing a single thing about her or ever uh, going to her and, and asking her anything about what she wants or, or what she desires in life. Three disciplines. Discipline of mind, of prayer, and God's Word. It's a huge and, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not even suggesting you put in eight hours of prayer every day. Start with 30 seconds. 30 seconds of focused prayer. God, for 30 seconds, I'm going to pour my heart out to you. One line of Scripture. Discipline yourself to, to, to at least one line of Scripture. Discipline what it is that we're putting in our minds. The challenge is that we stop taking our faith so lightly and we, we incorporate some disciplines that are going to honor God and they will then strengthen us for that ability for this upward spiral. A.W. Tozier once wrote, <clears throat> We must face the fact that many today are notoriously careless in their living. This attitude finds its way into the church. We have liberty, we have money, we live in comparative luxury. As a result, discipline practically has disappeared. What would a violin solo sound like if the strings on the musician's instrument were all hanging loose, not stretched tight, not disciplined? Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just uh, we come to you. We ask for your uh, your power. Lord, we ask that you would change our hearts. We ask that you would give us a task and appropriate for each one of us. We're not all called to be missionaries in Africa, Lord. We're not all called to, uh, to, to serve in the cafe at the church. We're not all called to, to play music on stage, Lord. But you have something for each of us that you have given us the ability and the power to do. Lord, I pray that we can, we can uh, speak with you, pray with you, talk with you and discover what those things are that you've empowered us to do, and once we've accomplished that, to turn around and give you glory and give you thanks. Lord, in the context of mothers, Lord, you've given them, you've empowered them, you've blessed them with children. And Lord, I pray that we as all parents can take our children, turn around, and give them back to you, dedicate them to you, glorify you, give you thanks, give you recognition that you've given them to us. Father, uh, we just pray for you, your presence and that you would make it known to us in a, in a wonderful way. I pray these things in Jesus' name.